All right. Welcome back, everybody, to VAWA's Quarantine Conversations today. We're going away from the coaches. We're going away from the officials, and we're going to go to the folks behind the mic who put on the show, who do the broadcast, who do the production. Today we have the Virginia Media Mafia, and uh, we're fortunate to have four of, of our best. Um, up in my left, to my uh, left, and, and up in the left-hand corner, that's Eric Olanowski. Eric is originally from Virginia Beach, uh, wrestled for Michigan State, and now is a huge part of the production with UWW. Uh, below Eric, that's Jason Bryant. Jason Bryant um, is just uh, one of the, the bigger, if not the biggest name in media right now around the country, around the world, announcing Olympics and world championships and NCAA tournaments and has his own podcast network, the Matt Talk Online um, Network. Next to Jason, that's Tim Foley. Tim is uh, the top dog, one of the top dogs with the UWW, putting on events and, and creating a lot of synergy. Um, he also um, writes for Intermat and uh, is a graduate of University of Virginia. He's originally from Stafford. I didn't say it, but Jason originally from Pocosin, Virginia. And down at the bottom, uh, we have Mr. Ken Berger. Ken Berger has been um, probably the staple of announcing around the world, doing three Olympics, also doing production uh, music for world championships, Olympic games, and also uh, probably the biggest announcer in the running world, triathlons and marathons. So gentlemen, it is great to have you on the VAWA uh, Virginia media today. Talk to me a little bit, and we'll start with Eric. How did you get your start doing media and, and broadcasting and announcing, and, and what makes it such a great thing for you? Well, I was looking for a way to kind of stay in the sport. I wasn't as successful as I wanted to be in college, and I knew that the Olympic dream wasn't there for me. Uh, after college, I had kids. Well, actually, when I was in college, I had kids, so I wasn't going to continue to compete. And the best way for me to stay in the sport was either – uh, to coach or become a part of the media. And I didn't have a lot of time because of my kids. So uh, Roger Chandler, my who was the assistant coach at Michigan State at the time, who is now the head coach, he reached out to the director of broadcasting at the Big Ten Network and said, this guy never stops talking. We just got to put him on a mic. And from there, they gave me a shot and it just continued to grow from there. I started to reach out to different outlets and different tournaments and see if they needed help and everyone continued to say yes I would say persistent is a good word for you I, I we see everywhere and really just uh beating the bushes and working hard to get involved and and you know you made a name for yourself uh you know at this year at the world championships and 17 and, and 18 at the world championships uh putting your name out there and it's not just the senior worlds you're putting yourself in in every event you can be in and you know kudos to you Jason, you know, you're typically the one giving these interviews uh, and, uh, and doing this. And, and tell me a little bit. So you wrestled for a short time in high school. You got involved with wrestling at Old Dominion, um, you know, as, as living with the guys and being up on the broadcast team and working for the newspaper. What has made wrestling in Virginia so important to you? It's it's simple. If it wasn't for coming through there and being being accepted, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I mean, you know, first time I met you, all right, we're ready. Hey, yay! It's like you knew me for years. First time I met Kenny at the Virginia Duels, you know, and I was that loudmouth kid from Pocosin who wanted to be on a microphone, and you know, I had to be reined in a little bit. But um, it was, you know, it's like when I go home for the, the duels, it's it's Christmas. It's it's where I get to see my wrestling family. So. Um, being accepted, even though I was somebody that didn't grow up in the sport, I, I didn't see a match until I was 15 years old. It was in January 1995. I tell the story quite frequently. It was against Deep Creek High School. I remember we won the match 37, 30, uh, 36, 33. And then a couple days later, I skipped school to go to the Virginia Duels. So uh, the Virginia wrestling community, and you really helped me cut my teeth, so to speak, is, you know, when, when Ken would announce Lake Taylor on Saturday, I jumped in and started doing the Friday. And then you know, can't open the door for me to announce the Eastern Region since he was still working with the officials more and he would do the state tournament. And then, you know, as I'm 18, 19 years old doing a lot of these high school tournaments, I end up announcing those high school tournaments to, to pay my tuition on the weekend. So really it, it provided me an opportunity. It provided me the experience and it really provided me and offered me a lot of, a lot of friends along the way, people I've now known for over 20 years. And it, it's one of those things that like, if, 
there's few things that would get me to come back because I do love living here in Minnesota with my wife and kids. But, you know, that is home. That is, that is where I'm always say, always from. It's like, oh, where, where are you from? I says, well, I'm from Virginia, but I live in Minnesota. That's how I classify everything. So um, it just – the, just the people. I mean, every time I go to Fargo, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, if it wasn't for Mark Strickland, I wouldn't know how to down block. And I learned that at 35. So, you know, there's, there's, there's funny inside jokes. There's, there's, you know, the times that VAWA, for example, before it was known as VAWA really gave me a chance as a, as a 19 year old kid that was um, maybe not in the, in the right place of mind sometimes that would may or may not have slept through a session sometimes, but <laughs> stuck with me and, and let me get through my formative years. And, you know, if it wasn't for those people, I wouldn't be here. And I'm, I'm grateful for all those opportunities that, that you guys have given me. And how many times do you think in, in all the years, have you been to the Taco Bell in, uh, in North Dakota, in Fargo? Cause I know we spent right, a well, lot of nights there. <laughs> Well, the first year it wasn't built yet. The first year it went out was 1999. The taco, or it was under construction renovation because the B-dubs wasn't built yet. And after you guys go out and get dinner, I'm sitting there. I was like, hey, can I go get something to eat? Because I'd be staying late after the dorm would close. And next thing you know, I mean, I'm eating Taco Bell like ooh, probably two, three times a day uh, at various hours of the day. So you can put two and two together there. But yeah, there was a lot of Taco Bell those early years before uh, I, I decided to have my own vehicle out there starting around 2001. Oh, man, it's been some good memories. And speaking of memories, you know, my first memory of, of Ken uh, was when you were coaching the Cavalier Club in and, and, and the, and the late 80s. And, you know, when you, your son wrestled for Woodson and, and you were actually working at the Pentagon when we had the Russians come in. And uh, ever since then, we've, we've really had a, a good synergy working together, um, you know, watching you ha spin, spin records and then also – uh, announced at all the big events. You wrestled at the Naval Academy and uh, you became a Marine. And, and how, does, how does the wrestling media uh, become such a huge part of your life? My God. Well, you know, born in New Jersey, you start wrestling by the time you go to first grade, second grade. And I started in third grade because uh, wrestling in New Jersey back in the 50s and the 60s was just coming in, like 1950s and 1960s. So that's when I really started getting involved in wrestling. And uh, of course, then going to the Naval Academy, wrestling under Ed Perry, who was an icon. Ed was uh, no doubt one of the best coaches. He could take those little quarter horses and he can change them into uh, somewhat of a stallion and compete against the big boys on the big stage. That's what Ed Perry had. He was a three-time NCAA champion along with Hugh, his brother, and of course, his dad. Uh, they were co he coached at Pittsburgh. So Ed Perry was a real big influence on my life and uh, kind of going back to Navy is the reason I was announcing wrestling in the NCAA championships in 1973. We were at the University of Washington and uh, I was wrestling a guy from the University of Virginia, Tim. I mean, Silverberg, I think his name was. And totally looking past him because the guy from Iowa State was next on the slate who I had to wrestle. And I got beaten over time to Silverberg. But I remember Ed, per Ed uh, Alaverde on the microphone saying something like, on mat number three, it's Ken Berger from Navy, and he is in trouble. So that's, you know, kind of like my Virginia introduction to announcing. And I remember, who is that guy? And that was Ed Alaverde's very first NCAA championship. I believe he was 33 years old, somewhere around that age. It was 1973. And... Uh, then moved to Virginia, 20 years in the Marine Corps, being a pilot, got involved in the Cavalier Wrestling Club, some great battles between W.T. Woodson and Robinson. You guys went round and round. I remember all your guys, you know, your dad. Dad and I became very good friends, and we decided uh, around 1988-89 that we, we kept our clubs, but we continued to join them together, along with Carl Spinweber and uh, Kurt Sabo and all the rest of those guys from Virginia. We said, you know what? If we combine our club, let's say on a Tuesday, let's go over to Robinson and bring our 10, 15, 20 guys. Then let's go to Oakton. And then we start having guys like Lloyd Keezer come in and get clinics and Pete Schuyler from Navy and uh, Wade Shawless, uh, guys who some of you guys didn't know who they were. I know you knew who they were, Brian, but a lot of guys didn't know who they were. So we brought those guys into the room to give our youngsters some great opportunities. This was Jason, unfortunately, this was in Northern Virginia. And this was uh, up in the uh, 
Woodson, Robinson, WT Woodson was in the first team duels, actually, championships, which I think Western Branch won because they'd beaten Great Bridge. Yep. So anyway, you asked me about the history then from, uh, let's see, coaching at WT Woodson, the Russians, that was the first junior national team from Russia that came over. And we took them to the Pentagon. We took them to the Capitol. That's when we could just walk up the steps yeah. and uh, take them on a tour and have that first team. And I still see a couple of those guys in the international. They said, oh, we came to Virginia. So I, I remember you guys wrestling them when you were competing. We had a pretty good, awesome team. You were on the team and we wrestled in Centerville High School that night. Jason, I think they went down south and they wrestled, uh, the Russians wrestled a couple teams down south because Jack Harcourt and Gary Hartranoff run, running USA Wrestling were big then. Um, let's see, then I got stationed, I was on a carrier down here as the Air Ops Officer on the old USS Iwo Jima. I was still coaching and then I started refing and then I went over to the Virginia Duels in 1993. One quick stop in 1981, I went back to the very first Virginia Duels I was single at the time, and I was on my first date with this girl, and where did I take her? To the Hampton Coliseum, <laughs> to the Virginia Duels. And I walked through the valley of the shadow of death into the Col Coliseum, and who did I hear but Ed Aliberti with, that's Navy versus North Carolina State University Wolfpack in the finals, and my alma mater lost to, in the finals. So that's kind of like the circle, Virginia, coaching, coming here, Met Jason when he was a youngster. I was just, you know, right, right out of the Marine Corps, 41 years old. I didn't really start announcing until 1995. So I was 44 years old before I got into it. And uh, Marine Corps took a couple of years off my announcing and coaching and wrestling life. That's it. That's how I got to Virginia. Anyway. Man. And, and, and Tim, so, you know, you grew up in Stafford, Virginia, Brook Point guy, uh, University of Virginia. You're an All-American. And you continue to be involved in the sport, starting writing for Intermat. How does it that you get involved with UWW uh, and in the, in the phase you are in now? I have good Zoom etiquette. I, I put the... the <laughs> um, I'm using a sandcastle to prop this thing up. So let me know if you can. Rub it in, will you? <laughs> I am seriously using a sand cap reform. Uh, yeah, what I'm saying is um, basically, uh, yeah, I got involved in 2013 during the Save Olympic Wrestling campaign and just quickly kind of we grew our, um, we, we, you know, we grew that media organization as fast as we could. And, uh, you know, as we started getting more sponsorships and, and more uh, television coverage, we, we were able to produce larger events that you guys have seen starting in 2015. It's been a more professional organization, more assets involved. And we can bring in a lot more, uh, bring in a lot more talent. But yeah, mine was 2013. I just got on the ground and got running during the Save Olympic Wrestling um, campaign just to try to get a little bit more coverage of some of our major events that we were uh, that we were hosting from around the world. Um, so it was it was it was a crazy year, as you guys all know. You guys were all a part of that as well. But you know, it was it was a lot of miles. And um, but I think we established some good some good. Um, uh, some good baselines that we've been able to uh, expand uh, on in recent years, including, you know, videos, documentaries, but also, as you guys know, you know, being able to bring a more professional service to the uh, the fans who are in the arena through your guys' uh, announcing and then also to the fans at home with the, uh, with the broadcast. And so I think as things have developed over the last, I guess it's what, seven years now, uh, we've seen ourselves turn into like a, and other man of the Olympic sports movement into sort of a, one of the standard bearers. You know, I think we have some of the best voices and some of the best, uh, and some of the best characters in all of uh, Olympic sports, and they all happen to be from Virginia. So, which which brings me to my next thing, and 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 we can kind of all talk about that. But but I'll say that uh, Jason, Tim, and, and Ken, uh, I would say that you probably your best trait in my eyes is that you're activators and you activate people to be better. Uh, you know, for me, Ken, you've brought me in to do events uh, around the country. And, and, you know, I, I, I uh, owe a lot to you, Jason, anytime that there's something going on, you say, Hey, let's bring Brian in and, and or let's bring Eric in and, and Tim, the same thing. When, when things come up, uh, you've activated our, our Commonwealth and, and you've brought us in. Um, 
So, so Eric, tell me a little bit, you know, you're, you're living in Michigan now, but still one of the Virginia mafia. How is that, that you feel still a part of the Commonwealth being activated by folks from, from our state? Well, well um, just for example, I remember for the Olympic trials, um, I believe you, I think it was you that what we were, working the NCAA championships and you had taken a different role for uh, the Olympic trials in 2016. So that was, somebody came to me and said, Hey, Hazard had uh, coach Hazard had reached out and said that you potentially would be interested in broadcasting for the Olympic trials. So stuff like that, even just being from Virginia, it's I mean, not really, I think even if I wasn't from Virginia, you still maybe would have, recommended me but I, I you're it. wrong eric he, he wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna recommend you it was all <laughs> it was all based on area code zip codes you had it was no, 757 no 703 757 540 you know uh <laughs> two up two down exactly so so ken i mean obviously i've known you in in lots of different roles as a coach um you know i i officiated for you uh you taught me a lot about that you've 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 kind of shown me the ropes when it comes to broadcasting and announcing. So tell me how important it is for you to leave a legacy of having guys, especially from the Commonwealth, being able to say, you know, one of my biggest influences is Ken Berger. And tell me, tell me about that. I don't know. I'm proud of looking at the screen right now. I mean, you know, I, I see Jason down there with so many times you drag him around the different, not only just wrestling events, well, t he'll tell you the uh, story about oh, the Irving oh, Ten Tyler oh. somewhere down the road, somewhere <laughs> along the road. But that may I, be over a couple beers. <laughs> yeah, not, not not over on things, but I, look, there's there's so much. Number one, you got to have this passion for wrestling. It's got to be in your heart. You got to bleed it, and you got to love it. And um, you know, like it, I, my mentor was Ed Alaverdi. He was absolutely the best. There's no doubt about it. My hat is always off to Ed, and I say he was the best. And he left me a couple good comments. He always said, be yourself, be true to yourself, be true to the sport of wrestling, give your passion to the sport of wrestling. So that's always been my goal is to do whatever I felt I could to allow Joe, the common guy, to feel like the Olympic champion. So no matter who it was announcing, whether it was a preliminary or whatever, and that's what I talked to all the guys, Jason, you, you know, um, Eric, sorry I couldn't get you on the uh, broadcast down there in uh, Rio. I tried, but my producer wouldn't let you. I remember that one session. I was going to bring yeah. you up, you on the uh, do some action commentary in the arena, but she goes, no, 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 we cannot have that. Sorry, no, no, no. <laughs> so anyway, it, it's kind of like leaving a legacy of of announcers. So, and, and like I told Jason down in Rio, I said, you know, Jason. Now you're at the top, you're down here in Rio, you're a young guy, you get a lot more, and I've told you this, Brian, not so much Olenowski. Unfortunately, now what you gotta do is you gotta figure out who's next. I love so, it. And you, and you guys will do that, so that's it. So you guys are now, you guys are the it, you're the all-stars. My hat is off to you guys. Uh, Tim Foley, I remember Tim wrestling, uh, and I, I'll tell you what, I was a big fan of your dad. Your dad and I always talked all the time. You know, he'd always come up to me when we were announcing the Virginia State Wrestling Championships, I think. Maybe the ACCs. Did I announce you there? Probably. Yeah, probably. You guys, Marine, you, you Marines are tight. You guys, run, you guys run deep. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah, your dad and I were – he was a Marine then, and we were pretty tight. So – Anyway, that's that's what I feel, Brian. You know, you guys are it, and now you guys will have to figure it out from here, and you will, because wrestling is just like one of those sports. We take care of our own. We work hard for them. You know, there's nothing better than uh, – I, I kind of was up this morning going, I wonder if we're going to do this, and and I'm sure you're going to get into this. So like, what was your best – what did you see? That What was your best call? What was the best matches? And I don't want to get into that if you have that down further on down our little dilemma there. But In my book. It's, I figured you'd probably call that one there because, uh, you know, if you're on there and you're giving it all for the sport and giving it for all the guys and all for the wrestlers, what else is there? That's my philosophy. Be humble. Give it back to the sport. Right. And, and, sure Jason, somebody you. and Jason, so, you know, obviously you're a little younger than me, and, and, but you've built your empire with the Matt Talk a little bit, not too much. I look a little – well, I did before Gray. Uh, looked a little older, but 
maybe I don't know. Uh, but so you, you have this podcast network now. You have this mountain on a hill that people are trying to get to. And, and you're bringing lots of, of people into the sport. You know, Eric uh, was the media association, 1516, the, the broadcaster of the year, which is part of your broadcast team that you are the president of the broadcaster association, right? National Wrestling Media Association, yeah. So there is a we have awards, and Eric has won a broad uh, won an award from there. As has uh, Tim and, and his work with the UWW uh, video team a couple of years ago. They were the new media specialists, which it's funny because that position that that award is like morphed over the years. It's like, okay, this is an awesome group of people. What the heck do we do? But yeah, I, I oversee that. Not to get off track. No, it's totally on track because I'm never really on track, as you know. But but tell me a little bit about the the, the squirrel. Uh, <laughs> tell tell me about your network and, and how you can bring wrestling to a forefront um, to, to our nation and to our world and why it's so important being from Virginia that you bring people in uh, into this media mafia, as we may say in Virginia. Well, the, the origin story of Matt talk, which, you know, Brian, you're, you were coaching down there, Tim, you were wrestling coming up through it back in the first iteration of Matt talk online and Bill Swinks, Virginia wrestling roundup. Eric, your older brothers grew up through it. You came on the tail end of when I had already gone. And Ken, you were, you were there announcing those events too. So Matt Talk Online actually started as a radio show in Hampton on AM 1490 WXRE, right next to, right next to Langley Speedway. And it was a, a couple of, one of the guys that trained me as a PA announcer initially, a guy named Greg Martin from Pocosin, who was also a local uh, radio fill-in DJ. He, he was also a dispatcher. So that guy always had to be near a microphone. And then Henry Ayer, who was a, a, an old wrestler and football player from Pocosin. And we started Matt Talk. I go to college, I get a, a, a blazing fast Gateway 2000, 1.3 gig hard drive, the biggest you could buy on the market, the fastest modem, a 33.6 modem. And I went and bought Microsoft Publisher and created Matt Talk Online. And it sucked. <laughs> it was so bad. Those designs were terrible. But I started, uh, you know, I worked as, as a phone snagger at the newspaper. So I was trying to get the results from the paper and put them on the web. And then Bill Swink up in Stafford, he was coaching at North Stafford at the time. Uh, and I had known him, met him when he was coaching with Ed Dyke at Louisa when they had come down to, to, to Group AA in, in the Bay Rivers District and Region 1. So uh, I had known bill you know casually and then we both connect and instead of it was one thing we did immediately was not try to compete with one another now sure i wanted to have some things that he didn't have and of course there's a little bit of that but he was a triple a coach i was a double a former double a barely an athlete but i was from a double a high school and we had a couple people in, in single a help out so we started that website out of my dorm room in october of 1997 and that was really kind of the where, where it was for about seven or eight years through college. I was in college for seven. Everybody knows that. And then the year I stayed before I left to go to Pennsylvania, Matt Talk Online was my life. And it was announced tournaments on the weekends. Part of that is I would get the scorebook. I'd type in the results, put them on the website, continue announcing the tournament. And it kind of, you know, kind of, you know, blossomed my my AD and my ADHD I guess or whatever so I could never never do just one thing at a time I always have to be doing something else and then so my career goes off I, I leave the newspaper after going full-time because they took me off the wrestling beat to Pennsylvania with the NWCA and Intermat but when I, I bring it all back to Matt Talk um, I had left the amateur amateur wrestling news in the open mat we're in a little bit of a, an ownership squabble I was caught in the middle and I'm on my way to world team trials in Madison and I you know I'm cutting out a lot of stuff with the family and you know marriage and you know whatever and i'm listening to xm radio and i hear i'm listening to college the college sports stations like oh, the auburn football coaches show all right we'll be back next one was the alabama coaches show or fine bomb and then the next show is like the oregon Co i'm just like wait a minute wrestling doesn't have this so i, I came up with the idea is like can i do a coaches show for wrestling and then you know kind of use it within this podcast medium that i had started in 2008 with wrestling 411 and then that went i had a show at, at you know, USA Wrestling, which I was actually hand coding, writing the RSS feed myself and just learning how the medium worked. And the medium hadn't quite taken off yet. Uh, right now, I think there's over, there's like 60 active wrestling podcasts and another 40 that have uh, gone by the wayside that are that pod faded, as they say. So I, I get this idea. I'm like, all right, well, it's, it's a microphone. It kept me fresh. I wasn't doing a whole lot of announcing at that time. And I said, oh, I might as well, you know, people are like, why don't you do your own thing? Do your own thing. And I thought I was going to have to compete with Intermat and the Mat and all these, these sites that I had worked with before. But no, uh, started up with the, the podcast thing, pivoted, was looking for a name for the website because the domain name got taken from me years ago on some weird situation. I was like, 
well, let me just search if mattalkonline.com is available. And boom, there it was. And there's my company. There's a rebranded in 2014, brought it back and completely different. The archives are still there. So I think uh, Eric's finals match with Ben Canning from the Matt Talk Ram Rumble, that result is up there somewhere. But, uh, you know, brute and high. So we're, we're sitting there just, I'm just, it was organic, really. It was, I started with Matt Talk. I was known for Matt Talk. And then when it came time to set up officially on my own and, you know, do things independently, I'm like, well, that it just kind of fell on my lap because somebody had owned the other domain I was looking at, wanted to sell it to me for $10,000. I wasn't interested, did a search for Matt Talk and boom, here it comes. So it came back in 2014 and, um, you know, in the Virginia side of it to connect it, Old Dominion and Mike Dixon, the assistant at the time was my first client. And the next day, Kevin Dresser was my second client. So I don't get this company off the ground if it's not for coaches I've known since I started Matt Talk. You know, Steve Martin was a great bridge. Kevin Dresser was at Grundy. He was the first opposing coach I ever interviewed in my career. I was 16 years old, chased him down at the AA State Tournament. So, so much of what I'm doing now with this podcast network all started as in the first iteration of Matt Talk and, and the relationships I had back then with guys like with Coach Martin and Coach Dresser. And, and speaking of those relationships, I think that's why we're all here today. But, but Tim, when we're looking at UWW and you're looking at relationships around the world, uh, how important is it that you bring guys like Eric and Jason and myself, who, who you know well and who hopefully you trust, into making your events so spectacular? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit on a good point. It's just a matter of trust. Like, no matter what the, no matter what the situation, if you have a, a – a, a, a number of people, especially like me, where you're coming into an international organization where you don't interact on a day-to-day -day basis, you have to make sure that the job that you were hired to do and any uplift you were supposed to do in that role or any sort of new asset that you're bringing has to be delivered and has to be delivered well. So you have to go to the people that you know that you can trust and people you've seen work hard and seen deliver products that um, are of the highest quality. So I think part of the part of this aspect of the uh, of the of the you know media mafia part is you know, when I got into a position where we could start working together, it became pretty, you know, I don't know. There was no reason to go search for, uh, you know, other other wrestling announcers or other wrestling broadcasters. Uh, you, you go with the people that you know and the people that you can trust. And um, and that's, you know, in large part, everybody on this call, right? With the yeah. exception of Eric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Speaking yeah, of, isn't, Eric, hey Brian, Eric isn't the adage been... you do business with people you know, like, and trust? Well, we'll at least have two of the three of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just Eric, Eric uh, you know, I'll I'll brag on Eric. You know, I think Eric, especially, I think everybody here has this trait, but Eric, especially, is uh, has become very. He's always has like the personality trait of hardworking and and passionate, but uh, he's always been really good at trying new things, whether it's you know trying new forms of writing or doing some in-house announcing or some broadcasting he's always willing and just prepares really well so um i think that's an example of you know why you trust the people that you trust and um and for me yeah of course that was really important when, especially when interacting with people from different cultures because then they go you know oh all you do is hire americans and that's not true by and large but it's like you know when we assign work it's it is people you trust and and um and then i have to tell them like nah not just that we all are from the same like general location you know like we're all very hyper geolocated yeah so and um, and what's interesting on that too tim is is gordon templeman with uw yeah graduate of first colonial high school yeah, where your like parents went road, to. yeah american university back in, yeah with soccer player yeah. and, and speaking of that eric so he said how hard working you are and, and i've seen it too you know you hustle around these events you do some writing you do a lot of social media things you do broadcasting if you were to uh, put together your perfect event that you could work. What would be the favorite thing that you would do at that event? I'd, I'd say broadcasting. I think that's that's what still I still get nervous doing it. Um, it doesn't matter if it's. I mean, shoot, I did a flag football game for an elementary school. Uh, teachers versus um, teachers versus students and. I mean, not not to like brag about this, but Joe Tessitore, who does Monday Night Football uh, with Booger McFarlane, I was working a ESPN basketball game, and he told me, "You're never too big. It doesn't matter how far you've gone, how far you're going to go. If you have an opportunity to continue to work on your craft, make sure you do that." And this opportunity came up, and I I just think back to that. Like, no job is ever too small or too big, no matter how far we've gone. 
Uh, so I would say broadcasting is still what makes me nervous. And that's, that, that would be my ideal to travel and broadcast. That's amazing. And, and Ken, kind of same question for you, but, but in a different light, uh, you're one of the top announcers and, and you have a very distinctive voice that people know, not just from wrestling, but also in, in the road racing game and the triathlons. When you're preparing for the uh, Cooper Bri River Bridge run uh, or when you're doing the, the Army 10 Miler or the Marine Corps Marathon or whichever event that you're doing, how important is it for you to bring back those wrestling roots? And how do you, how do you use wrestling as a gay, or as a kind of a platform for all the other events you're doing? Well, I try, I'll try to be honest with you. I use the same excitement. I try to use, uh, I use the same music, the same buildup, the same finish, the same thing that you see in any of the productions where I might be a part of where you're, kind of opening up the door in the beginning of the day when the people are arriving to letting them get ready and mentally get into it. You're not playing all the jazz and music, the fire in the cannon and playing all that pump up music. I do the same thing because I started in wrestling, but I ran triathlons and what do wrestlers do? Wrestlers run to stay in shape. So I started doing a lot of running. So I said, wait a minute, why don't I take this into other sports because wrestling predominantly in the United States is done in the winter. So you like to be inside and do things. And then in the springtime, come the long distance runs. In the summertime, come the triathlon. So I was saying, how can I stay engaged in different sports? I'll just take what I do in wrestling and I'll bring them out. And you would be really surprised how many triathletes are wrestlers, how many runners are wrestling. And they come up to you after an event, like uh, the Beast of the East, Last year, Brian up there, I had some guy come up to me and he goes, hey, were you at the top of the Delaware triathlon announcing? I said, yeah, that would be me. So I take the same thing, but I take the same passion because uh, wrestling is great. I don't know guys like Jason, you're 100% year-round wrestling, but that's because you're doing uh, the international all year round all over the world, and then you have the NCA, so you're strictly wrestling. Eric, you're kind of the same thing. But it's good that you can branch off. I had a laugh when Eric was talking about his story. Doug Ripley asked me to announce the women's state championship for field hockey on like the Thursday afternoon down at the Virginia Beach Sports Complex. And you talk about being nervous. I'm like going, I don't know anything about uh, field hockey. <laughs> he gave me the gouge. He told me what to do. He told me what kind of music to play. I just did my thing. But you're right. No matter how big or how small it is, you still get nervous. You still give the same pattern. So anyway, that's what I do with wrestling. That's what I do with other sporting events. And I have to tell the people, I said, look, I'm a wrestling guy. And they all know I'm a wrestling person, especially like it, uh, just this last year at the Olympic trials down in Atlanta, Georgia, was held February 29th. And the girl next to me was the 2004 Olympian, Kerry Collison. So, you know, my brain had a switch from refereeing the, the state championships in Virginia the following week doing all my homework. I did a lot of homework for it to announcing the U.S. Olympic trials for the marathon. And she goes, you're a wrestling guy. I said, yeah, I know, but it's, as a professional announcer, you got to be ready for anything. And I took my wrestling music and played that at the, at the marathon. When uh, the, the guy, I played Turbulence. It's a real good song. I think you've heard that. You guys all heard that one before. I think I stole it from you at an event. I think I have it, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I played that one when the male finisher qualified this year running down uh, the street down in Atlanta when he, uh, when he won the uh, Olympic trials. It was wrestling music. Same excitement, same fun. Anyway, there you go. And the turbulence of the weather down there this year for the, the Olympic trials for the marathon, that was pretty brutal, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, you have to be a wrestler to deal with gusts up to 30, 35 miles per hour with uh, the computers blowing off the table and you have a producer, and then you have the female announcer, and then you have the male announcer. I was doing more taking my redneck repair and duct taping computers <laughs> to the table and doing the best I could during the race. So the color commentator, Carrie Tollefson again, awesome announcer, broadcaster. She's more of a broadcaster. She does, she's the one you always hear at the Boston Marathon, things like this. She's tops in her field. 
she knows just like you guys, especially, you know, Jason, Eric, and Brian, you guys know all these guys. You don't even have to go to your books because you have so much knowledge in your brain about all these announcers. You know how many kids they have, you know, when they were born, all that kind of stuff. I go one sport to the next sport. I got to do extra hard preparation to get ready for that sport. So I was spending more time babysitting her, but I was the straight guy, which was okay. I was given all the Olympic history. I did my homework. I knew who they all, who most of the big heavy hitters were, but she was the one who knew who had a dog and who had a cat. She was <laughs> awesome. Anyway, there you go. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Tim, speaking of kind of craziness and chaos, and I, I know you're, you're a New York City guy moving down uh, back into Virginia Beach during this crazy quarantine. Um, tell me about some chaos that you've had over these last couple months with, with, as you moved back down and, and, in quarantine. Yeah. So I, 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 I did the, uh, I did, I did get COVID at, in early March and I'm fine. And there was no other people in my ha my house, but I came down on March 12th. So I've been down here now for gosh, almost two, you know, a little bit. Yeah. Two months. Right. So, um, it's good. I mean, I, I may have to hop off the call and go pick up my daughter because it's, uh, as you all know, we're all in that kind of situation where uh, we're parenting. And I know that other others on this call are actually even uh, becoming teachers in the short term as well. So, um, and uh, there's, yeah, there's a, a lot going on. But yeah, I, I mean, it's turbulent. But I think, you know, just like you rely on any relationship, um, my parents um, have been incredible and been really, really helpful, um, you know, with, with watching the baby and trying to balance uh, doing the work you know, at the international level as well. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think sometimes I, I look at it a little bit more optimistically um, in terms of my own personal situation because I have a beach now and <laughs> as opposed to a 900 square foot apartment, it feels, <laughs> it feels like a gift. So like before the call, I just went out in the, in the ocean for a little bit. I didn't do anything, but I was just like, man, 900 square feet is where I could be. Not allowed to go outside um, and, you know, compared to that i feel very fortunate and very grateful so and Absolutely. by the way if i do hop off it's not personal it's just that the baby has decided to wake up so i hear you well before the baby wakes up so uh speaking of uww and 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 events and some things that are coming up i know they're kind of a lot of a lot of balls being juggled up in the air sure. what's uh what's next for you as as we move forward and what what are your thoughts on what's going to happen here in the short term or even in the in the little bit longer term with UWW. Yeah, so Eric and I have been working a lot um, on creating content and getting it out in front of uh, our fans, whether it's retreads of old content, old content just reposted, or sort of original content, um, things we haven't seen before, packaged in new ways as well. Um, so right now that's the main focus. In terms of the actual events, um, you know, everything's gonna be kind of, rely everything's canceled up until July 1st, which, arguably it's kind of like august 1st because nothing was really scheduled in july that's going to be maintained um and then i think that's when they're going to start looking to do continental world championships now is that going to happen I, I i don't know i mean what guatemala does what italy does and what russia does um or how they react um is is all going to be independent so i mean in terms of uh cliches this is a fluid situation and we have to uh, we have to adapt but i know that the organization is um is focused on getting wrestlers to the mat um but not before it can be done so in a safe and controlled manner um especially with a worldwide type of event you don't want to be uh in the position where you're making people you know more sick so uh they continue to look at that situation but i think that in terms of what does look solid is um the qualification events for the olympics uh, the Olympics themselves, I think the way that it's pacing out with the ability to ramp up testing, uh, both um, antibody testing and just testing in general, uh, those types of large scale events look like they'll, you know, at least if you follow the trend lines would be manageable um, one off events um, come 2021. But it, it's difficult to say. But that's I think that the thinking right now is to try to get to try to get as many uh, events off as we can as safe as possible. And once there's a formula, for getting them done safely, there'll be a lot. It'll be a lot of tournaments very quickly. Yeah. So once once that gets packed in, it's going to be. I mean, as Thomas Bach said, you know, he wants to have like a like a preponderance. I believe was his word of events. So lots of places for people to to announce and to broadcast. Nice. And and Jason, speaking of content, um, you know, with your podcast network, 
I had the opportunity to do some quarantine conversations with Virginia college coaches. Obviously, your scope is much bigger than that. When you're talking to college coaches and we're talking to folks from USA Wrestling and from around the world, what are, what are folks talking about in, in, in their day-to-day in quarantine that you're discussing? Well, it, it's probably a lot like Eric's day. We're spending a lot of time with our kids and, and our work day is kind of have to be put in to situations where, okay, can, can we get this interview done? I mean, I'm working with Tony Roby trying to get the Virginia Tech show. I'm like, uh, what's, your, what's your home schedule like? Well, what's yours like? Well, then I also have to factor around my wife's schedule. So, you know, I always say that when I schedule these things, I have to work around everybody else's time. Well, now I have to work around everybody else's time and my wife's time. Because uh, as some of us know, when you work, when you work in the sport of wrestling, uh, you're typically not the breadwinner. So working around <laughs> her schedule has probably been the one thing that's been trying to even get these conversations. Because from a content standpoint, what, what you're seeing right now is an explosion of new podcasts, video shows. I mean, this is an example of one. Whereas those of us that do that full time now, have had, I've had to move off and I, I've actually done less content because of the amount of time I've had to spend with my kids, which I, I'm, I'm not complaining about. It's just, it's when you, when you're so, when you've basically been, you know, working at, you know, in wrestling for 40, 50 hours a week, and then you're going from to four to five hours a week, it, it kind of changes things up. But what I've found to, to your question, what's being discussed is we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of like best of type list. You know, we, I think the guys at Flow said this is Rushmore season typically where, okay, the season's over. Let's give us your, your top four of this. Well, now we're looking at, at interactive brackets online. We're looking at ways like, like Tim was talking about, retreading content, but doing it in a different manner. So the coaches are, are, are just saying, okay, well, how do we recruit? Whereas the media people are like, okay, well, how do we keep our jobs relevant and, <laughs> right now? And uh, you know, we did a 75th anniversary retread on the Rudis show, and then we we went that to the 90th anniversary team for the NCA. We're like, well, what's going to happen here? And so it's it's what it's also done is it's thrown a lot of history back out there. So when we talk about best of lists, most of the time you're like, okay, what do you remember from the last 20 years? Well, we've been able to bring up things from from the 1930s and 40s on the on the the episodes of the Rudis show that we did, and then when we we drift over to what you're, you're learning about with like Nate Yetzer when, with his move from, from Ferrum to Roanoke College and then the new programs at Shenandoah and Emory and Henry. And you know, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of different angles that normally we wouldn't get because right, right now we'd be focused and we'd be on the other side of the Olympic trials. We'd have our team set. We'd be building for Tokyo. Now we're getting a completely different conversation, which I think is beneficial in a lot of ways. We're making the best out of a, out of a rough situation, and it's caused everybody to adapt their content strategy, which for me is mean, means try to balance my time and you know sit there and look at me. When can we do this call? You know, It's like, okay, Abby, what's your meeting schedule like? To well, when's my next trip going to be? And when am I going to go to Tokyo? You know, I was, you know, t- we all know this, that, you know, a lot of those workforce people that, that you know, the, when the Olympics were postponed and moved to a year, well, that, that eliminated the contract for me for the time being. I don't know if I'm going to have to go through that and apply again, but, you know, it changes the way we live and it changes, you know, from a content creator standpoint, it changes the way we produce content and it changes every conversation. So um, we, it's, it's, it runs the whole gamut of, of emotions in terms of how you deal with it from a coach standpoint, from an athlete standpoint, and then as somebody who has to cover those people. Right. And, and Ken and I have talked about this, you know, several times with the schedule with wrestling and uh, triathlons and running races. And I mean, my second income is, has kind of gone out the window. And, and I know with, with Eric, I've watched you do some serious uh, teaching in your house with, with your kids and, and, you know, you're creating content when you can. Um, so, so what's, what's going on with you, Eric, and what, what kind of things, uh, come next for you? Well, Tim, Tim touched on it a little bit, but, uh, it's basically every day just making sure because a lot of the work that we do, uh, is it's worldwide. So, um, I mean, use track or flow or the open mat, they're geared towards American fan base and, with United World Wrestling, it's a lot different because our we have a large fan base in Iran, in Russia, in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, all those. So it's all different time zones. So making sure that wrestling fans have content throughout the day, throughout the night, uh, because when you're sleeping, uh, half of the world is awake. So making sure that we're constantly giving wrestling fans uh, fresh new content that they want to absorb and continue to grow the brand while these unfortunate times are going on 
And what's next? I, I'm not sure as of right now. Shoot, I mean, from March to now, it's, you know, NCAAs were canceled. Uh, Pan American qualifiers, um, I didn't go there. Uh, Tokyo, all that stuff. So I'm just looking forward to getting back, whether it's in an empty arena with just media and wrestling and no fans, I'd be okay with that. But I'm not sure for at least right now. Right. So everything's up in the air. So, and, and Jason was talking about lists. So Ken, you brought this up at the beginning. I had it written in my notes. You've been doing this uh, for a long time, you know, tell me a moment that really sticks out in your head in wrestling that, you know, you, you wish you could go back and, and watch it over and over again, because it was just like the most spectacular thing you've dealt with in the sport. Okay. Go back. I'll go back to 96 when you and I were in Atlanta. You were a security guard, and I was an athlete escort. Pith helmet was great. Yep, but that's okay. We, we were still part of it. You know, that's still part of the production, and that's when my wheels start turning about announcing and music production. So let's go to Kurt Angle's match with Jadidi, number one. Okay, 96. Now let's go to 2000. Let's go down to Sydney. Uh, you weren't there, but I was a national technical official, the guy that sits along the side and keeps the score. Waymaster weighs guys in because they need techies like us. I wasn't a UWW, then feel a one referee, but I was still involved in the Olympics. And I had just finished doing the timing and moved over off to the off mat. Lo and behold, Karelian and Rowan Gardner come up and he wins. The absolute most exciting match I ever saw in my life. And then when they had, they immediately went over to the award stand, you know, as volunteers, we're not allowed to have any, uh, like, we didn't have phones back then. We had those little cameras. So I pulled a little camera out and took pictures between the legs. And there was uh, people taking pictures this way. And I was between the legs of Rulon and <laughs> Rulon. And, and one of the biggest sights I remember seeing I'm 10 feet away from them now. You have to understand, I'm looking at them, and they're looking at all the cameras. And Rulon asked Karelin to come up on the number one place stand. And I heard Karelin look at him and go, yet. And he wanted Rulon to rule the day. I had a lot of respect for Karelin after that. He didn't go up on the stand and let, let Rulon do it. So that was 2000. Uh, 2004. Rulon coming back, placing third. I thought he still had a chance to win it. I thought he was going to pull it out. And I was doing the music production in Athens at the time, doing the DJ work, and I was hoping I'd play the national anthem for him. I got to play it for Kale. So there were two things in 2004, was watching Rulon put his shoes on the mat and retire, and the place went crazy. He came back and he gained respect. I played some kind of jazzy stuff. It was the first time in the Olympic Games they let us play music during wrestling and, and everything else. That was 2004. And I go to 2008 in Beijing where I was the presentation director and I got to announce all the, like the bronze medal matches and the gold medal matches, but I had to worry about music and running the show. So the number one, of course, was Henry Cejudo winning the gold medal, which was just, you know, tears to my eyes. So I, got a, I finally got a chance to announce Henry Cejudo as the 2008 Olympic gold medalist for the United States of America. Another match was when Adam Wheeler won the bronze medal. That was very important because the toughest medal is that doggone bronze medal. You get beat, you got to come back and wrestle, you got to get the repishage, you got to get your stuff together and win the bronze. I always say it's the hardest medal to win. So those are two from 2008. Now let's go to 2012. Jason, you were there, I think, working, doing the press work for uh, USA Wrestling. I was a production consultant, but I got a chance to do uh, announcing full-time, along with the British co-announcer who didn't know very much about wrestling. He was a rugby guy, and he was a good guy. And I did color, he did admin, and it was okay. It was the best match, absolute best match of the Olympic Games, in my opinion, was the semifinal match with Dennis Zarbush and Jordan Burroughs. Go back and watch that match. It was probably one of the most exciting. That's when you had to take two out of three. There were such tremendous scrambles and things going on, and that was just great. 
So getting to announce that one, and of course when he won the gold medal was the big thing. But that semifinal match was the best match internationally I, I remember watching ever. And then of course Jake Varner and uh, watching him win the gold medal. And when that was over, that was I think the last match of the 2012 Olympic Games. I was so exhausted. I went out in the hallway and I looked at, there was Varner's dad and his 94 year old grandpa with two Heinekens in his hand. And he goes, hey, would you like one, Ken? I says, Ken, straight, I would. So those <laughs> were the most exciting things. I know Jason, when he got, took over to PA in 2016, he'll probably tell you what his most famous ones and most exciting ones were. But to me, those were the ones from the Olympic Games. So I did the action commentary. Jason was on the mic. So I won't take any away of your Olympic glory, Jason, because I know there were a couple of matches that brought you to tears like those brought me to tears yeah you and we'll, we'll get to jason here in a second but but tim um you know i think probably one of the hardest things for you uh in in what i would look at is that you're obviously a, a a usa home guy and and you're you're you love the united states but you have to be in the middle because that's your job and you work for an international organization uh but you have seen from the change from FILA to UWW, and you, you've seen so many things change. Uh, your favorite things that you've seen happen with UWW or wrestling in general over your time? No, uh, my favorite things are always the things that uh, aren't publicized. Like when I'm like, oh man, don't do it, don't do it. And then they don't do it. And I'm like, great, we don't have to talk about this anymore. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's always my favorite moments is when. Um, uh whatever when when something that could go wrong doesn't go wrong um yeah i mean i think the 2016 uh 2015 olympic uh 2017 world championships when snyder beat sajalaya because it was cool for america which felt nice but it also was nice to be able to full put like the full force of our media team behind a, a good story that was going to have outside publicity and you know, I didn't have to play like the devil's advocate or something like where we're having to pump up Turkey's performance or whatever. You could just kind of feel like full throated in our um, in our approach to just celebrating the achievements of the of the U.S. team that year and, and what they're able to achieve. And then I think also looking forward and we, we saw it as a uh, we saw sorry I think I lost you we saw it saw it as an opportunity to um, to bring a story storyline forward. And in and, and, and even this is silly, but like. When we cut promos, and we were talking a lot about music and excitement and announcing, when we cut like the, the Snyder Live promo right before the 2017 World Champ, uh, before their finals, we took handheld footage, we cut it, put it to dramatic music, played it in the arena, people lost their ever-loving minds, and then the most dramatic thing happens, and the U.S. team wins it by a point. Everything, just everything worked out as perfectly for America. As it, as it could, and, and while that is kind of a Homer type of uh, reaction, that was a really, 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 really great moment. And second to that actually is, and to take away from my whole point, if you thought I was a, a USA Homer, I did actually, I didn't enjoy seeing Snyder get pinned, but I liked the fact that it was now one-to-one -one and that the, the Russian coach, you know, had sort of predicted all this. And so I saw the storylines developing. I thought that was really great. But um, yeah, I think for me, like that, that's, that's right now, those are the things I think about. Well, Ken talked a lot about the Greco guys, and you talked about freestyle guys. But one of the things that I think you do really well is you champion women's wrestling as well as anybody in the world. Yeah. How, how important uh, – you know, I read, your, I read your Friday, Foley Fridays and, and on, uh, on Intermat. But how important to what we're doing as a sport and as a community is women's wrestling right now? I mean, of course, there's, I mean, look, it, it depends on what kind of approach you want to take. If you want to look at it from the perspective of what is the best thing we can do to ensure the long-term safety of the of men's wrestling, it, you know, sort of IE wrestling that we care about. If you want to take that approach, that's fine. Then women's wrestling is what's going to keep you safe and sound for the next several years. But I think from like my perspective, I look at it and I say, women's wrestling is really cool. The storylines are as good. Sometimes they're better. And they tend to be much more media friendly, not just like in appearance or something like that, but they don't hold grudges. They'll train together and then they'll go wrestle and they're friends off the mat. They spend time in other countries with each other. Um, 
But I think just the development of, of women's opportunity. I know all of us, uh, I'm actually, I don't know if all of us have daughters, but I know that, you know, obviously Jason and Eric have daughters, but you don't have daughters. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Jason and Eric have daughters and it's like, you want to be in a situation where they could at least be provided the opportunity to go, to go towards that goal. Um, so I do think it's an incredibly important development. And I hope that in 2024, we'll see even more opportunity for women's, women's wrestling in, in whatever style it might be. Um, but I do think it is the absolute key to success. And I think it'll be the key to success at the NCAA level uh, over the next coming years as well. But at the international level, I absolutely like, am thrilled with their development. And a women's wrestling match is just never over. And that's what makes it so dramatic and amazing. Nine zero? You think it's over? <laughs> nah. You're a sucker. Yeah. It's not over. <laughs> he can get pinned. You know, yeah. Eric, uh, you know, you've you've obviously built your repertoire and you've built your resume, and you know, whether it be at the NCAs or in at in Big Ten Network with Michigan State, but some of your favorite things that you've seen over your broadcasting, announcing, uh, working with UWW over the last. Uh, umpteen years really for me it's and the thing big thing for me is obviously you touch on it with tim a little bit is taking the america out mm -hmm. of it uh so just seeing the history making performances um that's a big thing for me uh, and today for example like i had the opportunity to interview morton thornson from Norway. So seeing him win a European medal, second wrestler from Norway in the last 25 years. So stuff like that, the little nations succeed. And I know you're trying to take the America out of it, but like Stefan Micic or Amin, those guys for small countries, uh, that's big for me. Um, and I guess I, you didn't really ask, but uh, the favorite moment would yeah. probably be, uh, I, I was Matt's side. I actually got kicked out of the 2017 World Championships by the security guards. I was Matt's side, and I was filming it with my cell phone. And uh, I got to see the whole match, but they, they came and they gripped me up, and they put me in the back room. And Gordon uh, Templeman, who you were talking about earlier, being from Virginia, he had to come, like, talk the security guards out of letting me out of the back room. But, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, – Try, seeing those small nations succeed is is one of the biggest things for me. Yeah, and and Jason, you've you've obviously been uh, everywhere when it comes to wrestling from youth to high school. You know, you 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 cut your teeth at the Brut Adidas Nationals with me back in the day. Oh to, dear God! <laughs> um, all the Ooh. way up until the Olympic Games, but a you, Frank Lapoli tournament at the beginning of the Virginia Challenge years too. I mean. <laughs> If, if a tournament, if we weren't ready to strangle Frank at the beginning of a tournament, something was wrong. Because we're if you're on time, if you're ready to strangle Frank at the tournament like that back in the day, back in the day, it happened last year for me. But so I, tell what you, your favorite moments, and and we've I've been fortunate enough to to be alongside of you for many moments. But uh, some of your favorite moments as a as a wrestling person, I, the number one without question ever until I'm dead in the ground this will always be my answer and that is in 2016 when helen won of the united states's first gold medal but it wasn't just the fact that she won the gold medal it was how she did it and who she beat to do it she beat freaking superwoman right and you know if you look at the you know the fila database or the uww database as we now actually call it and you go look at sari yoshida's profile it's one 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 to 1998 at the juniors for example i mean it is it is um, it's it's disgusting how good she was and then to know helen i met helen when she was a sophomore in high school and then to, to see her progress through this and know what she went through and and you know just the surface level stuff but then <clears throat> to know we've never had one and then this is a little bit of a little bit of like you know knowing where i was at at the moment is that's i I got to call that, and I got to say the 15 greatest words in sports, and that's something I'm trying to get to people to, to accept is, ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the national anthem of the United States of America. I mean, it is something that until <clears> – <throat> Kenny, I'm sure you know this. Until you say it for the first time, the moment – you don't know what that moment's going to do to you because 
Helen's up there, and if she wins, of course, you know, I, oh, it's great. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm tearing up a little bit there, and I kind of keep my keep my composure a little bit on, on the press table. But when that that victory ceremony hits, and you say gold medalist and Olympic champion, and then here comes the the lip quiver. I mean, I, I you get the feel right. I mean, I'm getting it right now yeah. just thinking about it. like. And then uh, basically you have to hit that, and it's not a, not a mic button. It's a button that you press like on the com box, for, you know, from the United States of America. <gasps> and then, you, I mean, it was one of the most crazy experiences. I mean, to, see, to do it for Snyder and become the youngest Olympic champ for the U.S. was, was awesome a couple days later. But to, to, to see what happened to, to actually witness history and to be the soundtrack for that history was something that, I, I, like I said, I, as I explain the story right now, I'm being taken back to that moment. I can feel it in my chest. I can feel it right here as the, the, the breath is escaping me right now as I explain that moment. And that to, to, to this day will always be number one. It's going to take a lot to top that. Two other instances that are not Olympic related, because I've only done the one game. So I've, now, granted, seeing Burroughs win gold was pretty cool in London, but I was part of just the press staff then. But the World Championships will go to 17. Well, first, the opportunity to announce with Kenny at 2015 was the experience there and us all, you work on the side, and us sitting in that room, sitting there trying to get all these names together. And it's like, okay, we got Excel spreadsheets. Print. Ken brought a one-page printer with him. <laughs> I mean, we're in his he's – got, he's got the better room than we do. I think I'm, I, I think I'm rooming with Moen. And, you know, you guys got a – you got the Kapua suite up there in Vegas. But we're, we're sitting there, and it's like, okay, well, let's get our two beers and go through these things. So that was a cool thing to, to have my guys there. Um, and, you know, that was really kind of a jumping off point because before that, I didn't have any international PA experience. I had the broadcast stuff in Budapest, but, but that was kind of the jumping off point. Then we go to Helen and then <clears throat> Paris. Oh, my goodness. They, they knocked it out of the park. Crushed it. Paris as a – I mean, outside of Eric's squabbles with security. Uh, th but thing is, the security was legit. You were not going anywhere you weren't supposed to be. There was none of this like, you know, I've got an old <laughs> credential. I'm sneaking down to the floor. None of this Royce Alger type stuff. So what we would have – I think Royce did actually get on the floor anyway. He did. But you, you had that opportunity. And then we end with Snyder Sadalayev. And, and right before that match, I, I had just gotten an I Apple iWatch or an Apple Watch, and I had hit uh, screenshot. And before Sadalayev and Snyder took the mat, my heart rate as the PA announcer – was 143 beats per minute. Like, I don't work out that hard. And so, and then the finale there was great. But then the next year, the excitement, the U.S. wins it. I mean, we're in the picture. That's part of my bar here, my speakeasy. But again, the next year, and I actually said this on Twitter, is when, and Tim kind of touched on it, that's when Sad July beat Snyder. It was incredibly hard to swallow at the moment. And a pro wrestling uses a term, no sell. Like you, you don't react when somebody hits their power move on you. I, you know, part of me wanted to no sell that call and be like, winner by fall, I've done Rashid side of life. And, not, <laughs> not, not, and just say, screw you, you just beat our guy. But had to call it the same way. And just that energy was just like, I kind of channeled that disbelief into the voice. So, so do, you know, just belting it out. And it was just like, I cannot, you know, I was just like, man, that was really hard to do to an American. It was, it was really hard. <laughs> so those are three of the moments that I think that strike me the best. And then maybe off the mat, uh, Kazakhstan, which was an amazing host. Brian and I got kidnapped, basically, to go no, basically, to, we got kidnapped. We were supposed to meet with uh, the other announcer uh, who, who was, uh, his name, we called him Eric. Yeah. Um, it's something in Eric Russian. Shank. He spoke Russian and, and Kazakh. And we were supposed to, we thought we were supposed to do this radio interview. Um, how you like doing, how you doing? Three hours before the, the, the 230 session. So uh, they, they was like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll think we're going to do it in the hotel lobby. Well, they get this van. Oh, no, they're going to pick us up. Okay, we're going to take us to the radio station. They didn't take us like 35, 40 minutes outside of town in the middle of the steep. And then we end up going to a barbecue with like the youth director of the Kazakh Hockey Federation. And it was like in this old, I felt like I was walking through the, a set of that, you know, like, you know, outtakes of, you know, the, the, the barren landscape of Chernobyl or something or, yeah. or like, or Siberia, that horrible NBC series where it looked like it was just an abandoned campsite. And it was like Soviet era stuff. And we're like, well, they said, oh, there's this is these guys just grilling out. They got some scotch. They got some meat. They got some... It was one of the coolest things, but we we're like, I'm sending a pin to Tony Rotundo. Hey, don't know. If, here's where we're at. If we don't come back. I mean, it was like, I mean, we were wild horses everywhere. I mean, it was like, 
being kidnapped, we didn't know where we were going. And then having a cool barbecue with Hazard and, and these Kazakh, uh, Kazakhstan folks that, uh, you know, make sure that Kazakh is an ethnic group versus Kazakhstani, which is the nationality. Right. Clarify that. Don't want to start an international incident. But it was, that was one of the cooler things I got to share with Hazard uh, throughout the course of the career. We've, we've spent a lot of different days together and in different places, but uh, just being kidnapped to take a barbecue out with some hockey people from Kazakhstan is experience-wise as close to the top as you can get w with no competition speaking. Absolutely. Was this after we went to the uh, to that mall? The, yeah. In the, oh, oh I this never was heard the same after. day. No, this was one of the last days. This was the the, the day. Oh, this, this was, was our a day last of competition. Day. Yeah. We went to the mall when there wasn't a competition day. We had that leftover day. No, that we a... went to the outdoor or the oh, the with no. Nazarke. It was the day before. Okay. okay. That was the day before. Yeah. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, close up here in a second. And obviously, I've spent really some of my favorite time of my life uh, with you three and uh, had some amazing opportunities to do some things in wrestling and not just UWW, but NCAA and, and marathons and, and races and, you know, three of my favorite people in the world. But, uh, and, and I'm going to let you chat here in just a second, Jason, but. I, I got uh, one more thing to throw in there. Just go ahead. <laughs> okay. But, but, and so while you do this, I'm going to let Eric think of how he's going to do this. Uh, so I'm going to give you a chance to chat. I would like you guys. Uh, as broadcasters, as announcers, to give me a sign off and, and how you would do a sign off of your favorite event. And, and I know yours, Kenny, and, and, and I think I know yours, Jason, and I'm not sure of yours, Eric, but I'd, I'd like to do that just because I think what we do as broadcasters and, 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 and announcers is, is something that is, is true. It's, it's, it seems like it might be easy, but it's, it's super talented. And, um, and so think about that as Jason finishes with his, one of his favorite events. Well, the story, I need, I need to tell the story with me and Ken from, from Rio, too, because we were about 45 minutes on a good day away from the facility. So what happens is, is there's this, we, it was, we either got on a train and then another train and then a bus and then walked a mile. That took about two hours. <laughs> or... After a while and talking to our production team that we got a, a VAT pass, which is, you know, the sign you can put in the front of the taxi window and you can actually take a taxi that takes about 35 to 40 minutes to get there. It's only about 15 kilometers, if that. And, but we had to go through roadblocks. Well, the day after a famous American swimmer gets arrested. <laughs> All of a sudden, the pass that we had been using for a couple days, uh, sit in the front seat because it's, you know, fat guy rule. You get shotgun. Well, the, the security guard is not going to let us by. We're like, what the heck's going on? Well, I got a big old pass with a big old American flag on it. Well, you know, and the, it was a theory. And then so we have to end up, they drop us off. So they have to walk like two miles to get in that day. Even though it was quicker, it ended up being a long time. And we're trying to figure out what the heck's going on. And like, dude, lock, and then the next day, like it might've been a day after Lochte had came out that he had uh, kind of fibbed and I'm putting that lightly. And it's like, and we're walking, it was me, Kenny, it was um, the late Danielle Robin, who was the, the French speaking announcer. And uh, Kenny, what was the, your Brazilian friend's name? Um, Sergio. 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 Yeah. Who was doing the broadcast with him in, in, in Portuguese. And I, I thought about, we were walking, I was like, Ryan Lochte. And it kind of dawned on us that the Brazilians were, were pissed about what this guy would say about their country. And, I, you know, it would just be, it's like, okay, well, there's an American. Well, I mean, and the State Department people that were there were like, yeah, the Americans are going to have to deal with this a while after the games are gone, the expats that are down there. So the next day, we do the same thing, only this time, Sergio sits in the front seat. Me and Kenny are in the back. We turn our badges around. And so we don't see the American flag. We do the same thing, same security guard, boop. Sergio waves right on through. So we're thinking that it was definitely a retaliation because this swimmer made their country look bad. And as you know, and it wasn't, it's not the workforce. This was like the local police force that was watching this stuff. So I think they were just like, no, 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 no. So that was one of the more memorable moments of, uh, of, of, of that day is, is how Ryan Lochte impacted wrestling and the announcers in the 2016 Olympic games. I remember, you have a second. I remember I want to tag on to that because that day after Lockley, the day that Jason was talking about, I was doing the in-house action commentating along with Sergio, the Brazilian. He'd do it in Portuguese, I'd do it in English, blah, blah, blah. That was the day that the Mongolians did their thing. 
yep. where they went down all the way. To the <laughs> Good thing speedo. Tim's not on this part of the call. <laughs> this is where they went all the way down to their Speedos. And very sincerely, Sergio looked at me and he asked me, goes, Ken, now what do you think? And I said, well, I think that Speedo has a new representative for the brand because Ryan Loppy just lost his contract, but the Mongolian coach just got the contract. <laughs> so, that's that's we'll, awesome. We'll, we'll be proud of that. Oh, that's awesome. That was the best part about my uh, UWW credentials that, that I'm not from the United States, right? It's awesome. I'm Switzerland. Uh, I'm Swiss, so it's great. Yeah, but it also makes things difficult when we're at a USA party or something. Like, so wait, wait, what? <laughs> Sean Kenny from ESPN is also Swiss. I actually he believe is. I have his Asian championships credential around here somewhere because he couldn't get his visa in time. I got mine the day of for last year's Asian championships. So that's Crazy. another that's another story we could – I mean, like, again, it could be UWW Virginia story hour too, but yeah. – uh, We'll, we'll right, do that. So. We'll do it another time. We'll, yeah. we'll, this rest, the media mafia will, uh, will rise again. I promise. Uh, guys, I'm, I'm so happy that you've been on today. Eric, why don't you, uh, why don't you start us by uh, giving us your, your, your good night? Uh, I, I don't have a good night, but I just have this uh, scores, timers, tappers. Oh, report, report to your table, wrestlers. Clear the mat. <laughs> He's stealing my thunder there. Yeah. Oh, man. Jason, you got one for me? Well, on that uh, one time I said, gentlemen, clear the mats, and Brandy Golt from Oscar Smith turned and looked at me and went, hey! I'm like, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, clear the mats. So, um, really, it kind of varies by event. So, sometimes if we're coming off of a, of a heavy one, I like, like an event ender, is like, on behalf of United World Wrestling and those of us here from Hit the Roof, from uh, Laszlo, Pop, Arena, I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to think, remember the name of it. It's like, in Budapest, we appreciate you and your attendance for the 2013 United World Wrestling World Wrestling Championships. Join us tomorrow as men's freestyle commences with 55, 60, and 65 kilos. These weight classes are wrong, but I don't care. We'll see you tomorrow <laughs> here at you. You know, something like that. My, I'll, 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 in, I'll invoke the announcer voice versus the, the, the natural tone. I like it. Ken? Well, we know where this is going. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know where it's going because in uh... – 2009, uh, our good friend Ed Alaverde passed away. I was refereeing the World Team Trials. And I saw Ed. He sang the national anthem. I sat down with him and I said, Ed, I've worked with you for all these years. Can I use a few of your little sayings? And he goes, by all means, keep them alive, you know, because Ed had that great passion. And I use this for a lot of sporting events, not just wrestling, but mainly wrestling. I always tell everybody, Wrestling fans, wrestlers, we thank you for coming and supporting the world's oldest and greatest sport of wrestling. Wrestlers, always remember to keep your feet on the ground, reach for the stars, and go for the gold. We'll see you next time. Uh, I, I got nothing on that because that's the way we're going to end today. Uh, wrestling Media Mafia out of Virginia. Guys, you guys have been awesome today. And uh, I just can't wait to get back with you guys on the mats uh, so that, uh, and on the roads and everywhere where we can uh, continue our, our organized chaos of Virginia. So thanks again, guys. And uh, I, I owe a lot to you all, and I appreciate all you do for our great sport and for our Commonwealth. So have a great day. Stay back to you, Brian. Thank you, guys. Thank all you, right. guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you guys. All right. Yeah.